this next section that we're about to start is uh, is pretty long, so much longer than the last two. And we go through a bunch of different topics as a part of this unit. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to start in, uh, the first week or so by talking a little bit about microscopes. Uh, and then we're going to move into talking about cells and the structure of cells, how they function, what their parts are. And then we'll finish up by reviewing sort of some of the cell processes, things that happen inside of cells, why they're important for living things, how they work, things like that. So each of those has a different Yeah, quiz. there'll probably be a quiz for each section there. What? Well, well, you'll see, because you're going to be looking at that this week. So I won't spoil it for you yet. Yes. So why do you think we are going to start this unit which is supposed to be about cells by talking about microscopes. What's the connection? Danielle? So in order to like see what cell actually it looks like, you use the microscopes? Yeah, that mic microscopes are the key sort of technology that had to be invented in order for scientists to start to um, discover and learn about cells. Okay. Can I put that away, please? <coughs> so, when were microscopes sort of invented? Anyone have any ideas? <coughs> Past few centuries is correct. I'm guessing the 19. Before that. Before that, even before that, in the 1600s, what was the key thing that had to be perfect, or not perfect, but had to sort of be um, done well in order for microscopes to start to be used? Jack, uh, glass, glass, specifically glass. Magnifying. Sort of this a uh, magnifying glass is a type of Lens. So lenses are pieces of glass shaped in specific ways that bend light and allow you to sort of manipulate the light. And they allow you to magnify images, to see images from far away, okay, things like that. And so it wasn't until people really got to understand how to shape lenses using glass that microscopes and telescopes as well were first sort of started to become commonplace. So we'll talk a little bit about the history of microscopes a little later on. So we are going to um, mention today three types of microscopes. We will use in class two of those three. All right. So here's, did you guys use microscopes in elementary school? No. no. Not at all? No. Okay. I have one. Yeah, sometimes like you might buy one at like even a toy store and like they're really hard to use. You can never really see things very well. Oh, we're not using the weird ones? So, I'll tell you. So, yeah, the ones you kind of buy for, you know, $20 or $30 at the store, generally they are very hard to use and the, they're made with plastic lenses and they're not very high quality, so it's hard to really see things very well using those microscopes. We use, obviously, better quality lenses that are made of glass and metal microscopes that make it much easier to use and see things under the microscope. Bless you. So the three microscopes that we are going to talk about are the compound light microscope, which is this one. Okay. This is one that we'll use most commonly in class. This microscope is called a, either a stereoscope or a dissecting microscope. And obviously, microscopes magnify the object that you're looking at. And one of the things we talk about with a microscope is how much does it magnify an image? How much larger is what you're seeing in the microscope versus its actual size? So for these compound light microscopes, the ones we use, will magnify the object from a range of 40x, means 40 times, 
which you see is 40 times larger than its actual size, up to 400 times. That's sort of the range of magnifications for our microscopes. Some compound microscopes can go a little bit higher, up to 1,000, um, but we won't use those types of microscopes. This dissecting microscope does not give magnification as great. It goes from 10 to about 40. But it has other advantages versus this compound microscope. This microscope is a special type of microscope called an electron microscope. Okay, an electron microscope doesn't use light to make an image, like these two microscopes. It actually uses a beam of electrons. And because electrons have a much are much smaller particles and have a much smaller wavelength. It can magnify and has very high resolution. It can magnify a million times or even more. Uh, an electron microscope doesn't really look like a microscope you might imagine. It looks more like a computer. It has a vacuum chamber. Okay, it has a monitor attached to it. You have to treat specimens you're looking in a specific way. Uh, this is an image I took from an electron microscope. Uh, this was the wing of a, an owl. So I took this with the electron microscope. Um, yeah, this is about 1,500 times magnification. So not even near the highest the electron microscope can go, but you can see some, some really interesting things. So I'm going to show you some images from the different types of microscopes and explain a little bit about the difference. So the compound light microscope that we have gives you a very flat, two-dimensional view of the object. What you look at in this microscope has to be sliced very, very thin, or has to be very small. Because the way this microscope works is light from the light source on the bottom shines up through this little glass circle. You place your specimen on this stage, and light has to go through the specimen, into this lens, up through the nose piece, be reflected through the eyepiece, and then get to your eye. So in order to see something in this microscope, it has to be small enough or thin enough that light can pass right through it. I can't look at my hand under here, because no light is passing through my hand. It's too thick. It's too opaque. So you generally see thin, small, two-dimensional views of the object. Here's some things we'll see this year. This is, these are single-celled living organisms that live in fresh water. Okay, amoeba, paramecium, euglena, vorticella, radiolarins, foraminifera. Uh, oh. Many of them, yes. Not really drinking water, like fresh water, streams, things like that, unfiltered water. The dissecting microscope gives you a different view. Now, what do you notice about this? My? It has what? Oh, OK. Yeah, it has two slots to look through. What about the image I showed you on the screen? What looks kind of different about it? Jake? It's not zoomed in as much. OK, it's not. The magnification is not as great. What else, Sage? More detail. More detail. Olivia? The lens. Yeah, but what about this image? Oh. Like, what makes it different from the other ones I just showed you, Olivia? kind of three-dimensional. We can see sort of the shadows. We can see that it's not flat. Right? If I look at this penny, can you see a zoomed-in view? Well, you can see it's three-dimensional. A seed that's starting to grow. The wing of a dragonfly. And the reason we can see this three-dimensional image is because of the two eyepieces. Do you know how our 3D vision works? Why we see three-dimensional? Yeah, that's exactly the reason. So animals that um, have two forward-facing eyes, like us, like cats, like monkeys, apes, things like that, have good what we call depth perception. They can see how close or how far something is very well. Okay, they can have good three-dimensional vision. Versus like a fish, which has eyes on the side of its head, it does not have good depth perception. But what does it have? 
good sight. It has good, you know what that's called? Peripheral. Peripheral vision. So it's kind of a trade-off. And the reason our eyes give us good three-dimensional view is because they see objects, as William said, at slightly different angles. You probably have seen this. If you hold your finger close to your eye, in front of one of them, and like open and close your eyes, what's happening? Right. Is your finger actually moving? No. But when I hold my finger like this, this eye sees it straight on. But this eye sees it at a pretty large angle. And so if I look through this eye, it looks like it's there. If I look through this eye, it looks here. So our brain knows this. Now hold your finger farther away and, and do that. Does it move more or less? Less. Less. If you look across the room at something, what happens? It doesn't Hardly moves at all. So what our brain does is it interprets that. It says, okay, if I look at an object and both eyes are basically seeing it in the same spot, that object must be far away. If we see an object and both eyes see a very different position, our brain interprets that as saying that object must be very close to our eyes because our eyes are seeing it at a different angle. This is also how 3D, um, 3D goggles work, or those 3D glasses you go to a movie. What they do is they allow each of your eyes to see a slightly different image. And therefore, it can trick your brain into thinking things are three-dimensional. Did you ever see like those 3D glasses that are um, blue and red? Yeah. And if you're looking at a 3D image, it's drawn in red and blue. Right when you use those glasses, that's because the red and blue filters on each eye give each eye a different view of what's what's written there. If the artist wants something to look like it's very close to you, what do you think they do with the red and blue lines that make up the? They separate them by a lot, so each eye gets a different view of it. Or if they want something to appear far away, they draw them right next to each other. So anyway. Having three, the two eyepieces allows us to get a good three-dimensional view of the object. Um, can I have my eyes open? Yeah, yeah, you can see two, because each eye is actually perceiving in different places. Now, you usually do see it in different places, but your brain kind of merges those two images into one so that you see only one. The other thing is that a Dissecting microscope, I don't know if everyone can see this. The light is a little different. What's different about the light on this microscope? Okay? It's more yellow. Okay, that's true. How about something else, Mitchell? It's not coming from the bottom. Yes, it's actually coming from here. And so when it hits my hand, what happens to the light? It just goes on the surface. And then you're able to reflex goes through these lenses and through, so you can see them. So you could see a thick, opaque object. You could, I could see my hand if I look through this microscope. You don't need to have a very small, very thin specimen when you're using this type of microscope. How many arrows do you have? Couldn't see them with this. I couldn't see them with the compound microscope. Why don't they just put the light like that on the tape? Because there's not enough light reflected at a high magnification to see them. I was just wondering why. Yeah. Some, some compound microscopes do have two eyepieces. The electron microscope gives you some really cool images. It can, like we said, magnify quite a lot, but you have to treat the specimen in certain ways. You can't usually see a living specimen because it has to be like coated, coated in metal, placed in a vacuum chamber, and things can't survive those conditions. But here are some examples of, elect these are scanning electron microscope images. Okay? That's what they all that's these things look like. Sometimes they usually come out grayscale, like those top ones. People sometimes artificially color them to make them look a little better. That's a threaded needle. Wait, if there's a food cat with a dead cat in there, it's like a thing. It looks like a walrus. That's so funny. Oh, ew. 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 Ew.
Oh, Rain Mantis. Like that. That's that? just what these things look like. Is that, that a beetle? That's a bee. Spider. Yeah. Those are its mouth parts. Yeah. Uh, Grasshopper. Uh, fly. All right. Questions? Yeah, Matt. That's just the image it produces. It's very high resolution, and they're usually grayscale. It's just sort of what they look like. Sophia? Which microscope is the oldest? The compound microscope was the first microscope invented. Um, at first, they had only one lens. Now they have multiple lenses, and we'll talk about that today, actually. Sophia? You know how a thing has to be dead for it to be magnified? Is it before you on cat? I mean, the cat was dead. No, I think it was just um, sampled from a cat. I hope so. Danielle? Why are those in the compound thing? What are those other two? Yeah, I'll tell you right now. So we're going to talk about the parts. Caitlin? Um, was there any specific reason that the microscope were invented? Like, no, just people were working on you know glass grinding and things, and then they noticed that they can make an image larger. They started to use it for, to help correct people's vision telescopes to see things far away started to be uh, invented. So really just for optics, really. What? I don't know if he was the first, but he did create many telescopes and use them in, in his studies of the solar system, yeah. All right, so let's um, try to quickly talk about the parts of the microscope. So you will have to know the parts and what they do and how to use them. So first off, a compound microscope magnifies the image using two different lenses. One of those lenses is here, and one is here. The one you like look, put your eye to is called the eyepiece, which makes sense. It has a lens in it. It magnifies, our, our eyepiece lenses magnify the object 10 times. You can get different eyepieces that magnify more or less. These are called the objective lenses. The objective lenses, our microscopes have three different ones that you can rotate to select a different power. For our microscopes, the lowest power is 4x, medium is 10x, and high power is 40x. So depending on which objective is selected, it gives you different levels of magnification. This part I hold on to and rotate is called the nose piece. When you use the microscope, you have to be sure that it's clicked into place. Like when you turn it, when you get the next one selected, you'll feel a little click. That means it's in the right place and you'll be able to see the object. For, uh, for the microscope, can you see it in 40x? Like, can you see cells in 40x? Yes. But then what's that one? For this one, this is for seeing larger, not. I know, but like, what magnitude? What magnification does it go to? Ours go to 30 x. Um, so this body tube that the eyepiece is attached to just allows light to travel through. They have to be a certain distance apart to focus properly. The light source is down here. Different microscopes have different types of light sources. This has an LED light source. This is also battery powered. Other microscopes, this one is not battery powered, it has to be plugged in. This has a battery, it's, you can recharge it. This microscope, this is an old picture. You know what this is? It's a mirror. Older microscopes used to have just a mirror here. And you would have a separate light source that you would attach, shine at the mirror, and it would then reflect the light up. These are a lot easier to use. So this is called the light source, whatever is down here. The stage is the flat area where you actually put your specimen to be viewed. What we look at in the compound microscope are slides. Small pieces of glass that sometimes have some object mounted to it. It says the bee of a honeybee's leg mounted on it. We can also make our own slides using these sort of blank glass slides and cover slips. So you put the slide on this flat part of the stage. 
You can secure it to the stage using these metal clips. They're called stage clips. Underneath the stage, there's a little um, lever you can move. And it's hard for you probably to see. You'll be able to do this tomorrow, probably. This adjusts, can you see what it's adjusting? The light. Yeah, the amount of light shining through the stage. It's called the diaphragm. The yeah, it's a it's a different thing, but yeah. The um, arm is the part that sort of you hold on to if you're carrying the microscope, and then the base is on the bottom. They're pretty heavy. They're made of metal. You need to be careful when you carry it. And then there's two knobs you could see on this microscope. People often have the wrong idea about what these do. Most people think at first that they zoom in on the image, but they don't. No, they do. They change the position of the stage, and why is that important? So Have you ever had a magnifying glass try and burn something like a leaf? Yeah. What do you have to do? Hold it, Hold it at the right spot so the light perfectly comes to a very small point. You have to focus the light. These knobs focus the image you're seeing. If it's not in focus, what you see here will be blurry, or you won't be able to see anything. Once you turn those knobs so that everything's the right distance, it will be in focus and you can see things clearly. This larger one is called the course adjustment. It moves the stage a lot, as you can see. The smaller knob also moves the stage, but you could barely perceive it. It moves at a much smaller amount. And you use them at different times, which we'll be talking about tomorrow. Are there any questions about parts of the microscope? So tomorrow we should get a chance to use, practice using the microscopes. No homework. Today, yeah. I don't know about that lab. Do Friday, we'll see how far we get.